let's practice assigning oxidation numbers using the examples below. So item A is pretty straightforward. This is copper in its elemental form, no formal charge, nothing weird there. This is copper solid, solid metal. So the oxidation state of copper in this case is zero because it's the elemental form of copper. In SO2, drawing the Lewis structure I think is helpful here. We have double bonds between sulfur and oxygen and a lone pair on sulfur as well. So the sulfur is formally neutral and the oxygens are formally neutral as well. As is customary in the oxidation number paradigm, we're going to imagine pushing all of these bonding electrons onto the more electronegative atom. That's true for both bonds here. So oxygen is going to end up minus two since it's got two arrows pointing to it. You can imagine the oxygen atom with eight electrons around it, right? Four pairs of electrons for a formal charge of minus two. So in this case, oxygen is going to have an oxidation state of minus two. That is, each oxygen is going to be minus two for a total of minus four on each of the oxygens. So that's probably worth writing out. This oxygen will be minus two, and this oxygen will also be minus two. The four arrows pointing away from the sulfur indicate that sulfur is going to end up with an oxidation state of plus four. And in fact, if you imagine the sulfur with no bonding electrons and just the one lone pair, you'll realize that this corresponds to a formal charge plus four, since sulfur as a neutral atom has six valence electrons, and then the resulting structure would only have two due to this single lone pair. One thing that we haven't talked about yet that's extremely relevant in assigning oxidation numbers of ionic compounds is this ability to split an ionic compound into its component ions. That involves, first of all, recognizing that a compound is ionic by noticing the metal and non-metal within it, and then second of all, splitting apart the ions and giving them the appropriate charges and, and considering stoichiometry as well. So in case C, for example, we need to notice that this is an ionic compound. It's a combination of the sodium cation and the ClO anion. And the charges, you kind of just have to know. It's, it's worth knowing anyway, right, that Na in an ionic compound is always going to have a charge of plus one, and whatever it is involved with, we could say the, the corresponding anion, the, uh, the counter anion to Na plus, is going to have a minus one charge. So we have an Na plus cation and a ClO minus anion. The Na plus cation is a monatomic cation, right? And so we can immediately note that the sodium atom is going to have an oxidation number of plus one. As for ClO, this is a case where we should probably consider the Lewis structure. ClO, there's a single bond between them, three lone pairs on oxygen and three lone pairs on chlorine as well, and the ion has a total charge of negative one, right? So if we imagine pushing both electrons to the more electronegative oxygen atom, we're going to end up with eight electrons on oxygen. So oxygen is going to have an oxidation number of minus two, as is typical, right, for oxygen. That means that chlorine chlorine here must have an oxidation number of plus one so that the overall sum of the oxidation numbers comes out to negative one in accordance with the charge on that ion. Need to do the same thing in example E and split up this ionic compound into its component ions. Here a, an important polyatomic ion is involved, the nitrate ion. Since we have three of those and we know that nitrate as an ion has a, a formal charge of negative one we can reason that Fe in this compound is going to have a charge of plus three. That means that since this is a monatomic ion, we can directly conclude that the oxidation number of Fe in this compound is plus three. We can analyze the nitrate separately. We're gonna have three identical copies of the nitrate anion in here, so we only need to consider a single ion as all the nitrogens and oxygens in the other nitrate ions are going to have the same oxidation numbers as these. And rather than drawing out the Lewis structure, it's worth noting that oxygen here is fairly normal. It's going to have the usual oxidation number of minus two in the nitrate anion. You can verify that by drawing the full Lewis structure and applying, for example, this electron pushing procedure that we've seen before, but I won't do that here. That means that the total amount of negative charge on the oxygens is minus six, right, since we have three of those, which means that the nitrogen atom in NO3 minus has to have an oxidation state of plus five. The three oxygen atoms add up to minus six, the single nitrogen adds up to plus five, the sum is negative one, which is consistent with the total charge on the anion. And finally, we have Cr2O7 two minus, 
And this is a case where the Lewis structure would probably get quite messy, and it's a good idea just to think about oxygen in its normal oxidation state of minus 2 here. So we have seven oxygens in the minus 2 oxidation state. That's a total of 7 times minus 2 minus 14 on the oxygen atoms. That means the two chromium atoms must amount to plus 12 since the overall charge on the ion is minus 2. Since we know that the two chromium atoms must amount to plus 12, and we have no reason to believe that the chromium atoms will have different oxidation states, and this will be the case in all of the ions you see, by the way, unless there's a clear structural difference between the two metal atoms, we can assume that they have the same oxidation number. That means each of those chromiums is going to be plus 6.